Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted to get more done, finally achieve your dreams, or help lead your team toward your goals, then do we have the Coaching Habit Show for you. Today, I'll be talking with Michael Bungay Stanier, Rhodes Scholar, first Canadian Coach of the Year, author of numerous best-selling books, including a number two book on Amazon and malaria, and another great book, Do More Great Work, and a fantastic book to help you ask the most important questions of you and yourself and your team, The Coaching Habit. And that's just what we'll be talking about today, saying less and asking more, and changing the way you lead and do things forever. That, plus we'll talk about a glint of goldfish, the danger of advice, (laughs) synchronized nude male modeling, (laughs) why Pierce Brosnan jumped off a dam, the dangers of shovels, when will rhetorical (laughs) questions end, and what in the world happened in Budawang National Park. Gotcha. So welcome to the show, Michael. Are you ready to shine? Like a crazy diamond, Michael, like a crazy diamond. I love Woo-hoo! all those tempting, tempting, taut, t- tantalizing things that you've offered up to the folks listening in and watching in. So this is going to be a fun hour together. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, absolutely. So on that note, before we dive right into things, if you don't mind me asking, what got you banned from your high school graduation? <laughs> You know, we call it the balloon incident. And when I say I got banned from my high school graduation for the balloon incident, it sounds intriguing. The reality is a bit more kind of a little a little more prosaic. Mm-hmm. Um, it was it was my final year at high school, final day at high school. It has also coincided with my headmaster of 40 years retiring as well. And the the class the year before me had basically trashed the school on their last year. You know, they put super glue in all the locks they had uh, released a a herd of sheep into the main quadrangle and they were grazing on the sheep at another part of the lawn they put weed killer and they wrote some rude message in weed killer so it it destroyed the lawn so we had a very clear remit from the the powers that be Mm -hmm. you're not allowed to do anything anything on your last day at school well you know, that's not right. I know. So I was like, okay, so what could we do that would be not that we didn't want to damage the school, but we wanted to make some sort of statement. So me and a bunch of friends, we came up with this idea. It was to fill the conical roof of our chapel because we're a Church of England school with with helium balloons, you know, very tame, you know, really as about as inoffensive a prank as you could possibly do. I mean, seriously, filling a chapel roof with some balloons. Anyway, we, we did that. However, we were caught. The, the law was, was handed down. We were banned from the graduation. It was a tempest in a teapot at the time, but that's, that's the story. So thank, thank you for sharing that. So let's, let's go from there to another interesting story. And I have done similar things, so, so I, I almost feel bad for asking, what did you do with a shovel? <laughs> Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I love that you're talking about this, and and this is part of the introduction in the book, and 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 that we might have sent to you as part of this, because you know when you when you introduce a guest on a podcast or as a speech, I always get this impression that people's introductions are this combination of both daunting and boring. Mm-hmm. You know, they're like I have climbed mountains, won medals, been beloved by women, been praised by men. I mean, it's just. And it's kind of this big trumpet blowing thing. And, and that's all fine because it's nice to be able to celebrate your successes. But people love the humanity of failure and we learn from failure. You know, it's where we are shaped by our scars. You know, there's that saying wisdom enters through the wound. And I, I love that statement. And so I've collected my share of scars and wounds on the way. Um, some metaphorical, some literal. This is a literal one. Um, I spent a summer working as a, what I would call a laborer. So basically digging holes, mm-hmm. filling them in again, then digging more holes and filling them in again. So I'm digging a hole. Dig, dig, dig. I get down to about chest high or maybe yeah, about chest high. And I'm in a pretty big hole, which I've dug. And I come across a big rock. So I'm like, okay, so I dig around the rock. I dig yep. around the rock. I then reach down. Uh, you know, I threw my shovel up, up the top. I reach down lift up the rock, it weighs a lot, I throw it out of the hole, it lands on the handle of the shovel. Oh, no. The shovel then flips over, 
hits me right in the forehead, knocks me out, and leaves me unconscious at the bottom of the hole. I wake up <laughs> at the bottom of the hole. I'm basically drenched in blood. You know, I stagger out of the hole. I walk back to my colleagues, my my laboring colleagues. They're all like, "Oh my God, what you like? It's like the return of the Walking Dead." I get rushed out. I still have a bit of a scar right across my forehead where that shovel hit me, and in many ways, it was a a good a good guidance that this may not be the career path I should be taking. So how did you end up then? You talk about, in, and I've done this, I've, I don't know if it's 30, 40 small jobs, if that's the right term. I'm not even sure yeah. that's a fair term. 30 or 40 small jobs that I did. How did you end up deciding to go to law school then? Well, unlike the United States where law school is a graduate degree and you, know, you do your work, you do your time doing your undergraduate degree, and then it's a real career-driven degree. You know, law degree because that's where you make money, you become a lawyer. In Australia, where I grew up, it's slightly different. You can take a law degree as an undergraduate degree. And Australia has another thing which I really admire. They call it uh, combined discipline degrees. Mm -hmm. So it's quite common, instead of somebody going and doing a three-year undergraduate degree in a single discipline like economics or a Bachelor of Arts or whatever it might be, to spend a bit longer in combined degrees. So what I did as an undergraduate, I did a combined degree in literature and law. So instead of taking seven years, if I'd done them one after the other, these took me five years and I, I kind of got more bang for my buck. And honestly, I, I love literature. I, I, I still read a lot. I'm a writer amongst other things. My wife is a librarian. So reading and appreciating literature is, is important to us. But even as a 17-year-old, I'm like, I'm not sure what the career path is <laughs> with a with a literature degree. And I took a law degree as a kind of safety net. I don't know what I'm doing with my life. Maybe I want to become a lawyer. You know, thank goodness I did not become a lawyer. I mean, A, I finished law school being sued by one of my law lecturers for defamation, and that was a pretty good clue Maybe being a lawyer is not a, a good thing for you. Mm -hmm. But also, I just, I'm just not wired to be a lawyer, both in terms of the interest and obsession with detail, um, the bureaucracy of the, the legal profession, which it feels like is a lot of, a lot of that. And there's a lot of paperwork. And I'm on a much happier path, the path I'm on right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, you know there's a saying, Michael, uh, which I love, inspiration is when you're past suddenly makes sense mm -hmm. and you me everybody has had that moment where we keep coming to crossroads and we're like do i go left do i go right or does the universe nudge me one way or the other way you know and i had a series of good nudges that just helped me uh you know help me not pursue a path that might have been more tempting but um, wouldn't have made me as happy. I mean, as an example, you know, you mentioned I was a Rhodes Scholar, so that's a fancy thing. And when I was at Oxford, there's a consulting firm, McKinsey, that really, really uh, recruits aggressively to get Rhodes Scholars because they're they're typically smart people and they've done stuff and they're, there's a degree of status. You know, oh, we've got lots of Rhodes Scholars on our staff. And they pay an amazing amount of money when you're like you're at your first year at a McKinsey associate, and this was 20 years ago. You're paid a hundred and something thousand dollars. You know, that's an unimaginably large amount of money uh, for me at that stage. And I went for the I went for the information night to go. Well, what's it all about? And honestly, I just even then knew I would be a terrible, terrible fit at McKinsey. So, you know, we keep yeah. As you, you, you be as courageous as you can when you come to those moments and you go, of the choices I have in front of me, which one might enlarge me, which one might diminish me? And you hope you have the courage to step towards enlargement. Well, that's, that's a lot of courage at that young age to take that nugget. And, and really, this, this had to be a, a heart versus head decision. Well, it was, it was partly that. It was partly me just going... Look, I, I don't know much, <laughs> but I know I'm probably not cut out for this. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd done a, I mean, McKinsey is a consulting firm. It's based on, it's or, the, the founder of McKinsey had been a lawyer and he kind of went, I'm going to build consulting on the same structure as a law firm. 
And when I was studying law, I was a law clerk for a summer. Just miserable. I mean, just miserable. I was hopeless at it. And 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 it just, and I was just like, this is this is never something I want to do. So I had an I had a little bit of worldly experience to go, look, I know the money's tempting, but there's got to be something better you could be doing instead of this. I worked. I, I got a uh, in the U.S. It might be the equivalent of political science undergraduate degree. Right. Although I I balanced that with exercise physiology because I was trying to become a professional cyclist, and that was my real love. I just come from several generations of attorneys myself. Uh huh. I spent a summer. Actually, it was a fall after I got injured working for my dad's law firm, but doing a lot of work for his partner. Right. And and it's kind of much lower level than than a law clerk. I was basically given a broom and and told, "Oh, you're a college graduate. Here, let me show you how to use that." Right. Yeah, you know, it's not that much lower than a law clerk. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and actually, that that now, scared now me away. Cycling, I'm seeing the kind of Ivan Basso look alike there, a little tall, a little gaunt. I can totally see that. Well, thank you. I, I Euro- European glasses on. It's all coming together. Do you, do you remember Laurent Fignon? I don't. I don't remember that. He was a French cyclist that um, went up against Lance Armstrong, uh, not Lance Armstrong, uh, Greg LeMond. Greg LeMond's come back after yeah. he gets shot. He's going against this, this lanky, tall, blonde Frenchman that had on the same basic glasses that I have here, same basic shape, just not without yeah, yeah. the yellow. And uh, Le Mans got all his fancy aero gear, and um, Laurent Fignot, the Frenchman, doesn't have an aero helmet on, doesn't have aero bars, is just, just uh, I don't sure know. Sure power. Sure, and, and La- was leading into the final stage by an insurmountable amount and lost to Le Mans by eight seconds. I do remember that. I do remember that. Uh, I didn't remember him as a cyclist, but I do remember the excitement of that race and that mm-hmm. final, final uh, leg. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I raced over in Europe for a few years before I got um, uh, repatriated by an automobile. <laughs> uh, man, so. that's tough. I've got, I've got a good friend of mine who is a keen amateur cyclist who's just uh, – been taken out of a coma from having had that same experience about that conversation with the car that you lose. Is he going to be okay? I think so. Yeah. You know, he's got multiple fractured leg and the like, so he's not going to be as good as he once was, but I think he will recover. Excellent. And, and, you know, and this kind of gets us and we'll dive into the book here in a moment. This is these crazy turns and situations, if we can step back from them, are often what takes us on the most positive path. It's just often hard to see it in that moment. Right. Well, it, it becomes that moment where this comes right back to Victor, Victor Frankl and Man's Search for Meaning, which is, you know, whatever your circumstances, uh, which you can't control, what you can control is your response to them. Um, and it's so easy to make that sound glib and patronizing you know you're like oh i'm sorry this terrible thing happened but don't worry it's it's it'll be good for you or it'll be a learning experience for you and there's something about um how do you see the 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 how do you see that to be true but also to fully acknowledge the struggle and the pain and the endurance and the resilience that's required to work through that um, you know, I spent some time in the world of life coaching and in part moved away from that because I just found it was all too easy to be facile and glib and a bit too sunny about everything. Mm-hmm. And uh, and whilst not wanting to shy away from the power of something like appreciative inquiry or affirmations and the like, there's something also about seeing the shadow side and fully acknowledging the hardness of it all that is a more grounded humble response to a circumstance yeah sorry that's that's a bit of a rant there apologies no no that's 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 actually it's really important because it is easy and this is a very very typically positive uplifting show but the fact is sometimes you need the positive and uplifting when you're going through the crap and and right. to say this isn't crap I'm going through, that's just delusional. It's still crap. Right. And also your ability to learn and grow 
in part comes from your willingness to do the work with the with the the shadow side. I mean, I don't know if you ever read a book by um, Deb, Debbie Ford. It's called The Dark Side of the Light Chasers. You know, it's from it's probably 10, 15 years old now, and slightly annoying to read. It's a little bit kind of Californian therapy, life coachy. I find yeah. in its tone, but it's it's its foundations are its fundamentals are really great it's basically jungian and you know jung goes the gold is in the dark you know or i'd rather be whole than be good mm -hmm. and that whole idea that you, we have to address and process and recognize and honor and integrate our dark side not just our shiny side is part of what it means to be a subtle full fully human being Completely agreed, or else you're uh, you're like the stool that I'm sitting on, but with only two legs. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so let's go from there, and uh, maybe I get one last question on your history. Sure. What is Box of Crayons, and how did you end up in the box? Sure. So Box of Crayons is about 15 years old, and um, what it is now is a training company. Um, our broad mission is to help people and organizations do less good work and more great work. Mm -hmm. um, our real expertise is giving busy managers practical tools so they can coach in 10 minutes or less. And that, you know, that's why we're talking about the new book as well, because the book addresses that. Um, its origins are that, uh, you know, right when I started working, after a year or two, I, I was working for an interesting entrepreneurial company. I remember walking to work one day and just having this flash in London, UK, going, God, at some stage I need to start my own company. You know, I need to try that out without having the slightest idea what that could be or what I would do. I really had no, no intuition around that at all. And, you know, I, I lived in Oxford for a while, London for a while, Boston for a while. In Boston, my wife and I decided that we wanted to move again. The job I had at the time as a consultant wasn't really working out. Um, I lined up another job in Toronto as a consultant um, and had tickets to fly to Toronto on 9-11. Oh, so wow. you can guess how that all played out. The flight didn't go, the job vanished. Um, and, you know, I got a holding job for a while, but basically after that finished, I was like forced into starting Box of Crayons. And, you know, in the early years of Box of Crayons, and this might be interesting for anybody who's sitting there wrestling with starting their own business or in early days of starting their own business. Um, you know, my business model was pretty simple. I would say yes to anything. <laughs> you know, if you, if you had a poll, this is the hungry wallet, business model. Yeah, exactly. If you had a wallet, let's talk. And, you know, I think it was pre Google days, but you know, pretty much they go, can you build a space shuttle? I'm like, sure. Let me just Google what that is. <laughs> um, but, but, I think it's a truism with business, which is the more courageous you can be around focusing and claiming a space and finding a way of being different and differentiated and still having impact in this world, the the more your business will flourish. Um, and that's what's happened with us. As we've grown, we've also narrowed our focus and we've gone from doing all sorts of things to being a kind of training company to basically going, we're a training company and we just do this. We give busy managers practical tools so they can coach in 10 minutes or less. And you can see with that statement, people are very clear as to whether they'd like to talk to me or my company or not, because mm -hmm. I'm either interesting or I'm not interesting, rather than being forgettable <laughs> or being kind of whatever, which is where a lot of people end up. Going from there, it kind of sews it together with both Box of Crayons and the book and the braveness that you took. It's a, it's a later question you have in the book, but maybe it's a perfect place to dive in. The power yeah. of saying no. Yeah, exactly. So the, the book has seven questions. You know, Part of the purpose of the book was to say, what's the shortest book I could write? that would make coaching the most accessible to the most people. Because mm -hmm. coaching comes with a bit of a cloud around it, which is you, know, you have to be this kind of weird, touchy-feely, pastel-colored, loving, Muzak embracing, incense burning. Hey, wait, I'm a coach and I do not like Muzak. <laughs> uh, exactly. And so I was, and in early days, in one of my early books, a guy called Peter Block, who's a, a writer and somebody I admire a lot, 
wrote a blurb from my first book which said, look, coaching isn't a profession. It's actually a way of being with each other. Mm -hmm. And I love that. And so part of what really drives me is going, how do I kind of democratize coaching? How do I make it something that anybody can say, oh, if that's what it is, I could do that. And so the purpose of the book is to say, look, here are seven good questions. If you can stay curious with those a little bit longer, that's going to help. And the strategic question is the one that you're pointing to. And the strategic question is this, you know, if I'm going to say yes to this, what must I say no to for that to be a real choice? Because it's so easy to keep saying yes to stuff. <laughs> you know, it's like, it, it feels easier, it's nicer, it's less confrontational. But my fair bet, Michael, is that pretty much everybody here, everybody listening and watching, everybody who's been a fan of your podcast for years, nobody's really going, I just don't have enough on my plate right now. Everybody's going, I'm pretty busy, I'm pretty overcommitted, I'm pretty stretched, I'm trying to push a thousand peanuts forward, one peanut at a time. What if you could narrow your attention and bring all of your focus and courage and resilience and energy and creativity and resources and contacts to bear on fewer things? You know, do less, but do them better. And that's really what strategy is. I mean, strategy, people write long books about it. But I reckon that the definition I heard, which I love, is it's being able to say no to the stuff that you kind of want to say yes to. That makes perfect sense. So let's let's go back to the beginning a bit. Just mm. just before the questions, you asked some very powerful, the whole book is powerful questions, but, but one of the most important ones is one, we tend to go around, you talk about the Duke University study, we're all going around on autopilot. How right. do we build a habit and what does that mean? Right, yeah, because look, if, if you want to have an inspired life, if you want to be part of an inspired nation, um, what you're looking to do is not just listen to Michael's podcast, you're looking to change the way you behave. You know, uh, a very simple of definition of what coaching is, is it's insight that leads to action that leads to impact. You know, I've got a new way of looking at the world or a new way of looking at myself in the world. I do things differently and it changes the way I have impact in the world. And hopefully that then feeds into new insight. And the building blocks of behavior change are habits. If you don't know how to build and manage habits, you're really at the mercy of just good luck <laughs> in terms of trying to do things differently. You know, it becomes, it becomes insurmountably, if you say tomorrow I'm gonna, I'm gonna get in shape tomorrow and you don't put a habit in place, right. you, may, you may move the mountain for a day, but yeah, what about the next three days, day? Or, or six days, but... Um, you're exactly right. How do you how do you make it systematized? Because you know the key insight is this: if you're relying on your willpower, you're doomed. Because <laughs> you have no willpower. You do. You have a tiny amount of willpower that honestly most of us use up in the first twenty minutes of our day because we're checking email. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to build that. So part of the insights around habit building is structures really help you structures really help you. So a couple of things to say. The first is ignore everything you've ever read about. It takes 21 days to build a habit. And honestly, somebody just made that up. It's, it's not right. Um, secondly, don't try and change too many habits at once. Don't, Thank you. don't go, I'm, I'm about to, I'm, you know, the, yeah, New Year's resolution, classic. I'm going to lose weight, tell my partner I love them, write to my mother, exercise more regularly, meditate, build a spiritual practice, write the book, and eat nothing but vegetables. And like, yeah, and, or none of those. None of those is what you'll actually be doing. So it's like pick, pick a habit. Um, I don't know, Michael, if you know the work of Leo Babauta of Zen Habits, um, really popular blog. And uh, he's got a book called Zen Habits, his most recent book, which I really like. Um, and one of his key things is one, one at a time. So pick a habit. And then in the first book, the first chapter of my book, we talk about this thing called the new habit formula. And, you know, I've drawn on the work of people like Charles Duhigg, who wrote The Power of Habit, and a great book. Uh, BJ Fogg um, hasn't written a book, but has a great website called tinyhabits.com. And we created a simple new habit formula. It's got three parts to it. So here are the three parts. When this happens, mm -hmm. instead of, I will. 
So just to deconstruct that, when this happens, that's when you define the trigger, the situation, the context, the thing that sets you off. If you don't know what your trigger is, you're in a world of pain because you don't know what's going to hook you into the old habit. Instead of is when you identify what your old habit is. And then I will, what you do there is you identify a new habit, but one that you can do in 60 seconds or less. It takes more than 60 seconds to do. It's probably too big and too complex, and it means that your brain will find a way of getting it out of actually doing it. So, you know, um, let's say you want to start exercising more regularly. Don't say, I'm going to start going for a morning run. Say this, when, I, when this happens, which, when I wake up, instead of mm-hmm. going to check my email or feeding the cat or whatever it might be, I will, and here's your 60 second habit, I will put on my running shoes and step out the door perhaps. So you can see there, you're not committing to going to run, but you're creating kind of the first step, the micro step that will kick off a larger habit. You know, I know a lot of people on this podcast have a spiritual practice. I bet if they're like me, they've, they've meditated, then they stopped meditating, then they cursed themselves for stopping meditating, then they started meditating again before they forgot to meditate. And you got, you're on that roundabout about I'm trying to build a meditation habit. So here's how to think about it. Uh, here's how I might write my own meditation habit. Mm-hmm. When this happens, when I wake up and after I've fed the cat, instead of checking my email, I will, here's my 60 seconds habit, sit on my meditation cushion for one minute. I'm not committing to meditating. I'm not committing to meditating for five minutes or 10 minutes. I'm just saying I'm going to sit on a meditation cushion for one minute. And the truth is, even I can't think of a reason why I don't have a minute to sit on a meditation cushion. And what happens, and I use this for myself, what happens is most of the time, not all of the time, because I'm a weak person with no spine, but most of the time I build, I, I say, I get, okay, I'm here now. I will meditate for eight minutes or 10 minutes, whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. Does that help? Does that kind of give you a sense of what, how to think about habits? It, it hugely does. And maybe, maybe we should dive in for just a minute more on the importance of making a vow or making that vow as, as the, well, this is all a way to anchor, but what, what more can you say about the vow? Yeah. So th- this is a classic piece. It won't surprise people listening to it when they hear it, which is about connecting your habit, if you can, to a greater good, you know, something that's of service beyond just your own self-fulfillment. So back to Leo Babauta again, and you know, this is something I picked up from his Zen Habits book. Leo's vow in his early days when he gave up smoking was a commitment to his wife and children about not being a father who smoked. And all those structures plus that commitment, I, I'm doing this for my wife rather than I'm doing it for myself, makes it that much easier to do that. So why, if you're building a meditation habit, why are you doing that in a way that might be beyond, beyond your own self-service? I'm doing it for my wife mm-hmm. so that I can be more present with her and less triggered by her, for instance. That makes sense. Can you tell us what it means to practice deeply? Yeah, so, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of good stuff about there. There's a new book just come out by Eric. Anders Ericsson. Anders Ericsson, thank you, um, called Peak. Yes. And he's really one of the, the, the primal thinkers about this kind of deep practice. I also really like the work of a guy called Dan Coyle. He wrote The Talent Code, mm-hmm. really good book. Um, and in The Talent Code, his, his curiosity was piqued by, look, why are there these hot spots of talent around the world? You know, why is why does one tennis court in Moscow generate some you know lots of the world's top ten women's tennis players? Why does Brazil have a lot of insane Brazilian soccer players? Why does the Juilliard School in New York somehow attract and create these brilliant musicians? And there's a number of factors, but one of the factors is a real understanding about how to practice deeply. And I bet you a majority of people listening and have probably done the I learned a musical instrument for a while. I learned the piano as a kid. I was terrible. I have not a whole lot of musical talent. 
seven well, I do years remember piano. <laughs> yeah, just kind of like going through this motion going, oh, my God, when will this end? Yes. And kind of doing time rather than bringing attention to it. And the whole idea of deep practice, it has another co- number of concepts to it. The first is break down the bigger thing into lots of smaller things. So, you know, as an example, if you're practicing tennis, practicing your tennis serve, you don't want to practice a tennis serve. You want to practice bouncing the ball or you want to practice throwing the ball and just throwing the ball and just throwing the ball. And then the second piece is about repetition. Yeah, you, know, you do that. You do it slowly. You do it quickly, as fast as you can. You experiment, but you keep trying to testing what that's like. And the third part is you really begin to feel what success looks like. You know, so when you throw the ball, you're like, oh, yeah, that's perfect. That's just that's going to be in the position I need it to be so that I can pull off a great tennis serve. So this whole idea of practice, deep practice is summed up by this. Better to practice deeply for eight minutes Mm -hmm. than to practice shallowly for an hour in terms of embedding new ways of behaving. Oh, it's it's interesting you say that because if you take the the uh, ten thousand hour rule, which which uh, Anders or Anders he was kind of misquoted on. It's not right. ten thousand hours of practice. It's that deliberate practice of practicing well and deep, like you're saying. Or else, if you practice throwing the ball wrong for ten thousand hours, yeah, you're just you're just a, you're just a good at throwing the ball wrong. Exactly. Yeah. I'm just building what you're saying because it's not even if you practice kind of in a non-deep practice way for 10,000 hours, you'll be good, but you just won't be really good because you haven't brought that mindfulness to to the process. That makes sense. So from there, it's interesting. If we become mindful of a practice, of a habit, of anything that we start to do, particularly if we start to get any success in it, we start to get feedback. And by feedback, I mean resistance, Mm. negative resistance to the new habit we're putting in place. What's going on there? Uh, resistance from yourself or resistance from others? Resistance from yourself. You say when we try something new, we yeah. start to get resistance. Reasons we can't do it, shouldn't do it, aren't going to be yeah. good at it, or should stop. Yeah, I, I think that's true part of the time. I think it's particularly true when we are stepping towards a bigger, braver, better version of ourselves. I mean, in box of crayon speak it's when you're stepping away from good work Mm -hmm. the everyday get it done work and stepping towards great work the work that has more impact and the work that has more meaning part of you is inherently drawn towards that because that's where impact and meaning lie and you're like i'm hungry for that part of you goes i don't want to leave the comfort and familiarity and safety and certainty of good work which i know how to do i know how to do it well I know how to get it, do it without screwing it up and making a mistake. And, you know, every, every time you sail away from the harbor into the ocean, it's an adventure and it's scary. You know, that's one of the measures of doing great work is like it doesn't make your heart flutter a little, a little faster. Does it, do you have that moment where you're going, I really don't know what the hell I'm doing here <laughs> and it still feels like the thing for me to be doing? That sounds like me when I wake up just about every morning. <laughs> and, and the more success we have, the more my heart flutters. And, and it's not so much, I don't know if it's a fear of losing it. Maybe it's being, it's like swimming in deeper waters. The deeper it is below you, the, the more, at least for myself, scary it right. is at the surface. Well, let me ask you this. So when you started this podcast, yeah, um, and you haven't been doing this podcast for that long, right? We are a week shy, five, six days shy of September 11th is when we started, kind of to, to, to bring light to the world. So we're, right. so we're just about a year old. Yeah, fantastic. And you've had amazing success, right? You're, as you said, you're like number three in the self-help thing, which is spectacular. Yeah. Um, but I bet this interview with me is a whole lot easier than the first three interviews you had, where you're like, have I got the thing set up technically correctly? Am I asking good questions or dumb questions? Um, how do am I staring at the camera or am I forgetting I have a camera and therefore staring at my computer screen and therefore people are just seeing my bald spot? You know, there's a bunch of places where you're now in a place of comfort around this. 
So then you could say, look, that might be fine because there may be other parts in the work that you do in the life that you lead where you want to step out to the edge of who you are and what you can do. Mm-hmm. And you might be going, so how do I bring that sense of danger back to the podcast? Because now I'm kind of cruising, you know, and so is it is it the caliber of guest? you invite i mean obviously if you've got me on the show you're scraping the barrel in some ways so it's only way is up from there but you may be going all right so it's great that michael's here but how do i get richard branson or so ken robinson or those people who part of you is going i don't even know how to ask find those people to ask them yet alone to actually ask them you know do you experiment by going uh, you know, I'm guessing you're 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 doing this in your studio at the moment. Mm-hmm. So going, do I hire a studio and I, do I lift the production values around that? Wow, that could be good, but that's a whole bunch more money. So do I need to then b- figure out a business model behind this to drive sponsorship? Well, who would I want as sponsors? There's a bunch of terrible sponsors, and so you've got the opportunity to say, how do I not settle with the podcast? How do I continue to push myself so that the water gets deeper? Because at this stage, how, whatever the depth of the water is, you're swimming pretty comfortably over it. I can't even remember why I'm on this rant, but just to say <laughs> that um, you know, we, we, we all have this opportunity to constantly step out to beyond our good work into our great work, because what will happen is what has been your great work, the stuff that gives you the flutters, after a while you get comfortable with it and it's not so hard. It's interesting. We had a day earlier this year where I don't I don't know what happened and our numbers temporarily quadrupled, quintupled almost wow. overnight and our whole uh, graph of looking at at our at our numbers and it was completely different like looking at it from the clouds above and looking down you could see how what you thought was important before isn't important from this new higher vantage point. Right, right. And it, it was a really both a lesson in perspective and um, a motivation to climb. And it, it's not a climb to, oh, I just right. want the number one show to have the number one show. We want to change lives. And to do that, I feel like I need to get uncomfortable. And then right. once that becomes, this is what you're talking about, good to great, when yeah, you yeah. get when you get uncomfortable and then you get comfortable well then if you want to keep growing living learning it's time to get uncomfortable again yeah i I heard a phrase that i really liked it just the other day it said life is a series of false horizons you know it it reminds me i you know years ago i was hiking in the himalaya and you know i'm carrying my own pack and i'm too poor to hire a sherpa or, or somebody carry my pack for me and so I'd be walking up this steep, steep hill, and I'm like, I'm so close to the top of it. It's going to be fantastic. And I get to the top of it, and it turns out it's not the top of the hill at all. It's just a plateau before the, the, the mountain continues. And it's a little bit, you know, it's a nice metaphor in the sense that we're all climbing, we all hit plateaus, and then we all face a choice to go, do I stand on this plateau or do I push to the next height? And uh, it, it's not a, a judgment call, but I think over time, give yourself a chance to catch your breath, for instance, to anchor yeah. yourself. But sure. then if you want to, I, I look at it, my wife and I wrote uh, uh, a few interesting books a few years ago. The, the bestseller Barefoot Running is one of ours. And the, the, the uh, analogy, oh, wow. <laughs> Woohoo! Exactly. So if, if you, if you, um, If you don't strengthen your foot and if you use art support to support your foot, over time your foot gets weak and it comes collapsing down. So if you get comfortable in life where everything is on cruise control, it is a habit. You no longer need to use your systems. Right. You come crumbling down. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. And then what happens is when you find different ways of strengthening, so you, you strengthen your feet so you can do barefoot running or, uh, you know, those minimum shoes running. Am I right in remembering that part of what's in the store in the, in the book is learning to run in a different way as well? Absolutely. So, so it's like um, my memory is it's like 
Is it you're kicking up your heels more aggressively? So it's, well, the heel is part of it. The most important part is instead of landing flat or on the heel, which you're designed to in a counterweighted uh, heel-centric yeah. running shoe, you shift your weight forward. It's kind of more of an right. embracing life. And so right. you're landing more on the front or just behind the front of the foot so that you use everything down there as a fantastic spring-like yeah. mechanism. Yeah, I remember that. And, and just changing the way I ran a little bit to... Um, almost focused on kicking my heels up mm -hmm. rather spring, than, spring, spring, rather spring, than my spring. Dri driving my knees forward. Just completely changed the experience of running. Uh, I'm not sure how this is. A I mean, this may not be a metaphor. This may just be a plug for barefoot running. Your book. <laughs> this is no, genius. I, I, think it's, I think there are many metaphors in there. There's being present with yeah. your running. And we actually went on to make a mindful running program. So presence is a big part of it. It's trying to find out a na more natural way to move, but it's also challenging yourself big time because right. you're, you're saying, I'm going to get rid of the support. I always like to say it's, it's like casting free from the dock and putting right. yourself out to sea. It's a little bit scary when you take off the shoes. When I went for my first 100 yards and it was because I had a, a titanium femur and titanium hip, I was told I'd never be able to run again. When I took off my shoes, it was out of desperation because I had no other way to run and I wanted to get feedback and learn right. how to go again. And it was scary right. as hell. Right, I love that. And I think that's the connection, that, that's where we started with this, is, is the, the nature of feedback as a way of what is this Am I attuned to the feedback and do I know, do I figure out what to adjust based on the feedback? Yeah. So let's go with a few more of your questions. And they're both questions you can ask of your team if you have people underneath you or people you're yeah. working with. You can ask of your family, but you can also turn it in a sense and put the mirror right on yourself and say, right. what's on your mind? Exactly. And um, it, that's the opening question in the book. And I'm going to add one other question in there. It's the second question in the book. It's the it's the awe question, A W E, and it's a it's awe is it's because it's awesome, but it's actually an acronym. And the awe question is, and what else? I'll jump and in for a, a brief brief second. Do you ever watch Columbo, the old? I did, but it's been a long time. I mean, um, I loved him in. Have you seen The Princess Bride? Yes, yes, yes. So he's, he's the grandfather reading the story in The Princess Bride, one of the best movies of all time. I mean, for the people who are listening to this podcast, finally you've got a useful takeaway, <laughs> and it's, you should go watch The Princess Bride for the first time if it's your first time or for another time if it's not your first time. 50th time, yes, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. So, so Columbo. Columbo, and I'll give it real brief because I want to hear your answer more than mine, but at the, at the end of almost every interview, I use what I call the Columbo question. And if the end of his, he's, he's can't solve the murder. The bad guy is getting away with it. The bad guy is, has said goodbye to Columbo. That's it. Got away with murder. And Columbo goes, oh, just one more thing. <laughs> Can I borrow a pen or just yeah. one more question for you? Yeah, And nice. that one more question. Okay, Correct. go. The R question. Open. Yes. Yeah. So what's on your mind? It's a really powerful question to ask somebody else because it's both open but focused it says it says t t talk about anything you want but don't tell me anything you want tell me the thing that you're excited about or anxious about or worried about or consumed about it somehow directs people to talk about something that matters and so much of this book is about driving conversations more quickly to be about things that are more real and what's in your mind, I find, is a great way to kind of accelerate a conversation towards something that matters. And if you add, so oh, good, that's lovely. And what else? And what else is on your mind? Good. And what else is on your mind? Okay. So if we had to pick one of those, where should we start? It's just a very simple way to go really quickly. Let's, folk, let's end up narrowing our gaze onto the thing that actually you want solved, you want addressed, you want talked about. So many meetings or conversations, somehow a topic gets started and nobody's that interested in it, but it's become the topic. So we feel an obligation to work our way through it and it wastes everybody's time. And what else, Michael? <laughs> well, and what else would lead me to offer up the third of the questions, which is also, I think, one of the great questions to reflect on for yourself, as well as asking other people, which is, so what's the real challenge here for you? So if I was working with Michael or talking to Michael and 
let's say that we put on the table, I want to take my podcast to the next level, just because, you know, we we're talking about it before, I, you know, just as a fake potential great work topic. What might be really interesting is I go, so Michael, I know you want to make take your podcast to the next level. What's the real challenge here for you? And what that does is it, it's very different from going, so what's the challenge here? Mm -hmm. It's better than going, what's the real challenge here? Although that's a more interesting question. What's the real challenge here for you? Swings the spotlight away from the podcast and swings it right into Michael and a conversation about how is he dealing with this challenge? And it becomes a much more powerful conversation by adding just those two words for you on the end of the conversation. When we do that, how do we, it, it's a term you use in the book, I think it's really important, focus on the real problem, not the first problem. Yeah. So part of it is just, is just having the discipline to go pretty sure that the first challenge is never the real challenge. Mm -hmm. I mean, it might be sometimes, but if, you ha if you're a betting person, you'd bet against it rather than for it. So this is when it comes down to going, so what are we even talking about when we say coaching? And it's like, how do you stay curious just a little bit longer? How do you rush to certainty, advice giving, answer giving, just a little bit slower? So you say, what's the real challenge? And they go, blah, blah, blah. And honestly, what that will do is it will trigger in you this delight because you're like, oh, that's so good. Now I know what the challenge is. I can add value by telling them my ideas, my thoughts, my opinions. And, you know, they're, they're probably okay, but now's not the time for them. Why don't you just go, good, what else is a challenge? And what else is a challenge? Okay, so what's the real challenge here for you? And that's a much more powerful intervention, which is for them to go deeper into what the challenge is. And what's amazing is when they find what the real challenge is, often enough, they'll actually know what to do, what the action is. You don't even need to share your advice because they're smart enough to figure it out themselves. I like it. Can you tell us, um, we've had Simon on the show, starting with why, yes. and, and really love him, but can you give us your opinion of why starting with why may not be the right way to go? So it's all about context, because one of the most powerful things you can do is do what Simon suggests, which is get to the heart of why the heck are we doing this? You know, what's at the heart of what we do? Why are we do why are we doing this work? Um, and that's a powerful place to reflect. It kind of takes you to great work. It takes you to all of those things. However, in the context of an everyday conversation, I think why questions are not nearly as effective as what questions. Because when you say to somebody, why, why are you doing this? Or why did you think that? There's a couple of things that come up. The first is, unless you get the tone just right, why will make it sound a bit accusatory. You know, the context is basically, why the hell are you doing that? <laughs> and you've got, you've got to be really careful with the tone. And if there's any kind of imbalance or vulnerability, it can kind of knock the, the conversation off the rails. The second thing about why is it's often a justify this. So suddenly background starts getting filled in. Mm -hmm. And then you're going, so in whose service is it to know this background? Because the person who's answering the question already knows this stuff. So why do you need to know this stuff? Well, is it because you think you need to solve the problem? Well, now you're trying to be lazy. You're trying to not solve the problem, but to help them solve the problem for themselves. And you don't even need all of this background information. So for me, as often as possible, I try and start my, my questions with the word what. Uh, if you start with the word how, what that does is it's driving a little bit towards action. You know, what's going to get done and there's a place for that once you know what the real challenge is. But if you just come with the awareness that you probably don't know what the real challenge actually is, staying curious about that longer is the, actually the smart thing to do. How do you, if you're, if you're in a challenged situation and you're mm. not sure what the real challenge is, what is your protocol? What, is, what would Michael do with Michael? Yeah, so if somebody asked me, so what's the real challenge here for you? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, I don't even really know. 
I would offer up two things, like two suggestions. I'd say, first of all, well, okay, that's fine. You don't need to know. We're, we're, this, is, this is new territory, so we're all doing our best. If, if you had to take your best guess at what the real challenge is, what would your best guess be? And that gives permission to have a go mm -hmm. rather than feeling like I have to get it right. The second thing I might offer up is I say, so why don't you go and have a think about it? And, you know, don't put too much pressure on yourself, but come up with two or three best guesses about what you think the real challenge might be and then come back in 10 minutes or an hour or a day or a week and we'll have another conversation about it. Can you tell us from there, um, both for ourselves and with others, um, getting comfortable with silence, what does that mean? Well... I, I bet you a bunch of people already know my answer just from hearing your question, which is they're like, oh, man, I'm so willing to jump in and fill the void. You know, I ask a question, there's half a heartbeat of silence, and you're like, oh, my God, the question's terrible. They don't know the answer. It's awkward. Let me talk a little bit more. And being comfortable with silence or at least managing your discomfort with silence is probably a better way to put it. Mm -hmm. First of all, it allows people who are introverted, if anybody's read Susan Cain's book, you know, to actually have a chance to reflect and figure out what they want to say to you. Secondly, sometimes silence gives people just a chance to think stuff through. And as they're sitting there and you're going, oh, my God, it's a disaster. It's been over two seconds, silence. where well, the other person is going, oh, the cogs are turning. I'm actually making progress and trying to figure this out. You're creating that aha moment. So don't ruin it by talking over it. It's fascinating. When uh, I have my wife on the show, which is a rare special treat, she's the producer, and usually she's a co-host, but usually not on the mic. When I have her on the show, she's known to pause a lot. But She's an introvert. She's, she's very sharp, but she, she takes the time to crank through and come up with the answer. So at first, I was steamrolling over her all the time. Right. I was like, oh, don't want to have that gap in there. And now occasionally we actually have that, that awkward pause because I've waited so long for the answer to come out of her. But actually, she was just waiting for me to ask the next question. <laughs> I know. Well, that's the risk you take. But, you know, if the worst is a slightly awkward pause, that's not so, that's not so terrible. No. And, Plus, and you, can, you can always edit it out. Absolutely. And you could get the best answers come from hanging in that pause. And I have to think the best answers come for ourselves in that awkward moment to, uh, again, an, an, an old crap moment of what am I going to do? And, and being with yourself just a moment longer or more right. can make a big difference. Sure, I agree. So uh, let, let's talk about just a few more questions. Then we got just a, a few wrap ups. What would you consider a really important question from a strategizing for our lives point of view? Well, I think one, one we've already touched on, which is if you're going to say yes to this, mm -hmm. what must you say no to to make that yes a true commitment? But almost before you get before you get there, you have to ask yourself, what do I want? And that to me is a foundation question. It's the fourth question in the book. So it's kind of the middle question of the seven. Um, and what do you want? What do I want? And difficult questions to answer. You know, sometimes they're relatively easy, but if you go, no, really, what do you really want here? That's much harder, much more elusive. But that is truly the existential question. You know, what's, what, what do you want here? And once you can get to a place where you're clear on what you want and maybe the other person is clear on what you want, mm -hmm. you've got the basis for a successful conversation about stuff that really matters. So it's hard. I, I try and avoid this question myself because it's too difficult. But uh, it's it's really worth sitting with and going, what do you, you know? So what do you want? What what do I want? And see what emerges from that. Do you? We talked about it a little bit before the show, so it might not be a, a meditation practice. But is there anything that you do? to get yourself into a place of understanding yourself? Because that is such a big question. Yeah. I mean, I'm a slippery, I'm slippery. <laughs> and I'm slippery for myself as well. So I have a number of structures that help the spotlight shine on me. You know, I have a mastermind group, a group of master coaches who we've hung out for a decade. So we know each other very well. 
Um, what that means is they know all of my evasive tactics and they won't let me do that. So that's a space for reflection. Um, I go in and out of um, morning pages, you know, journaling, just writing about stuff and trying to get reflection there. I go in and out of meditating. Um, I have a, an executive coach, which is a little a little less on reflecting, but that's part of the conversation for sure. So I just set up a number of external structures that increase the odds that I'll have a chance to self-reflect. Because if I left it entirely to me, I may never do that. Anything else? You know, I, that's a good question. And the answer is I don't think so. And what's good about that question and that answer is it speaks to one of the anxieties people have about asking and what else, or is there anything else, which is what happens if they say there's nothing else? And the answer is you go, no problem. So here's another question for you. So give so, me another question. So here's another question for you. Lovely. What's been most useful for you? Love it. So for those listening and who may not have read the book, which is probably all of you, um, that's the final question in the, in the, of the seven questions, the learning question. And the insight is um, people learn not from hearing something, not from saying something, not from doing something. They learn from reflecting on what just happened. So for everybody listening in, I think it'd be great for you to take that question on and go, of everything that Michael and Michael have covered here, and we've covered quite a lot. We've covered all sorts of stuff, everything from random cyclists to seven questions to who knows what. Um, of all those things, what was most useful or most valuable for you? And, and Michael, I've actually got some ideas about what's valuable for me, but what did you find valuable from this? You know, we, we all operate from our own ego place. And so I was thinking about the show specifically and the wonderful guests we've had on and some of my goals for the future and how I get to challenge myself. Right. And so what I hear from my filter is not only a beautiful show that's going to do a lot of good for helping people. And I'm, I'm sitting back here going, this is your candy. I mean, I'm having yeah. so much fun beyond, behind the mic. But I'm also hearing Michael challenging me. And I like that. It's it's a little uncomfortable, but it's important. Right. Yeah. For me, I always enjoy a conversation where it's not entirely predictable. You know, I did not think we'd end up talking about Greg LeMond and Crazy Friend Cyclist and, and knowing that or Barefoot Running as part of that. So I love it when those richer, slightly unexpected topics come in and flavor flavor the conversation and it's felt there's a lot of a lot of interesting spices in this particular dish i, I couldn't agree more so let's let's go for a, a few quick wrap-ups that might th make things even more interesting can we apply any of this to parenting or kids so i don't have kids so i can't speak from first-hand knowledge around that i have heard from lots of parents that they feel there's a lot of power in ask, using these questions with managing kids and teenagers and the like. So as with all of this, it's like, why don't you try it out? Why don't you experiment? Why don't you ask your kid, you know, what, how, how, what, what was most useful or valuable at school today? And what else? And what else? And see where that takes you. I like it. No so guarantees. <laughs> Quite all right. So from there, a question we like to ask all of our cast before the end is what personally brings you the greatest happiness or what I call the woohoo factor? So, so I've, I've been married for 24, well, we've, I've been with my wife for 24 in some years. And it's not a woohoo factor so much as a just it's like a deep base line of contentment and that's that's the fundamental thing that grounds me um and then there's all sorts of little things that where i love kind of losing myself in the moment i play ukulele badly and i love picking up a ukulele and just trying to play a song or two um i play soccer you know and i'm this old dude running around trying to keep fit and not have a heart attack but I love that experience of playing soccer and doing my best and trying stuff out and testing my skill around that. So there's a bunch of small day-to-day -day stuff, everything from reading a good book to kicking a soccer ball. But there's a foundation, which is my relationship with my wife. Woohoo! <laughs>
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> I've got to ask, how'd you meet? Uh, we met at Oxford where we were studying. She was a high school dropout, mm -hmm. but um, went back to university and ended up doing a PhD at, at Oxford. She was living in a house with 17 other women, three of whom were other Rhodes Scholars. And so when I first arrived at Oxford, I just, those were the only people I knew because they put all the Rhodes Scholars together to meet. So once I got cotton on, there's a house with 17 other women. I'm like, why would I not hang out there? Um, and so that's how we met and the relationship went from there. I love it. It's good numbers and good odds. Exactly. <laughs> Even so, I could get lucky. <laughs> <laughs> so where can people f go to find the coaching habit, uh, your beautiful book and to find out more? So, um, the first place might just be to the coaching Um, it's a website about the book. There's a ton of free resources, so you can just get a whole lot of stuff regardless of spending 10 bucks or 12 bucks on the book itself. It's of course available at Amazon. Um, and it should be available at most bookstores and airport bookstores and the like. Here's my favor to ask. If you do happen to pick up the book, and if you're so moved, you're so inclined, I would be really grateful for an Amazon review. Uh, I have My big hairy goal is to have a thousand reviews on Amazon at the one year birthday of the book. So today is basically, the, we're halfway, the six month party, and we're at about 350 or thereabouts. So we're doing good but there's a way to go to get to a thousand. So should you pick up the book? Should you be, care? Uh, a review would be really gratefully received. And you've definitely got one from me. And I'm so glad you asked. You're the first guest on the show, first off, that's asked. But secondly, that's a powerful tool in life to not be embarrassed, but actually ask for what you want. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm all for that. And, and also, but also to hold it lightly. Like, I'm like, if you do it, that's great. If you don't choose to do it, that's fine as well. I appreciate you having heard the request. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So I've got to ask my Colombo question. Any last words of wisdom you want to share with the audience? Well, there's always, there's always one piece, which is always be a bit suspicious about other people's advice because, you know, it's self-serving and it's almost never that good. So bearing that all in mind. Um, I'll, I'll leave people with the question we already touched on, but thinking about what matters to you most, what it takes for a really good life, a life of inspiration, what do you really want? And I'll leave that as a point of reflection for folks. And I'll leave that as in anything else in the air. We don't even have to go there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Michael. This has been a lot of fun. I highly recommend The Coaching Habit for people. I think it'll get you thinking. Thank you. Thank you so much. For everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get The Coaching Habit, and start asking questions, and shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you, Michael. This was a lot of fun. It was a pleasure. I really enjoyed it. It really was a nice, eclectic conversation. So it's fantastic. Hey, you do a good dance. Oh, thank you. It's you, you, you lead well. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>